Chapter 11. A Joyous Unboxing Moment. Exceptional Rune Talent. Madame Marion, despite her sharp tongue, had a heart of gold. This became evident when Blake, after returning to his room with a slightly red ear, found his hands filled with the desserts Madame Marion had generously left for him. Without wasting a moment, Blake arranged all the desserts on his bed, but didn't give them a second glance. His excitement was directed elsewhere, towards the treasure chests waiting in his system space. Ensuring complete privacy by checking the doors and windows were securely locked, Blake settled into a somewhat battered chair with an air of anticipation. His focus was entirely on the system space, where several treasure chests lay in wait. After a quick inventory, Blake counted a total of five chests, one bronze, one silver, two gold, and most thrilling of all, a supreme treasure chest. This last chest, as confirmed by the system, was of the highest quality, and Blake was pleasantly surprised to have acquired it so soon. Deciding to build up the excitement, Blake chose to start with the lower quality chests, saving the best for last. System, let's open the bronze treasure chest first, he whispered, barely containing his excitement. Ding! The system is opening the bronze treasure chest for the host. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining intermediate cooking proficiency. Cooking? Well, Blake mused, beginning to discern a pattern in the rewards from the system's treasure chests. This particular chest, dropped by Madame Marion, whose culinary skills were renowned, seemed to have a higher drop rate for cooking-related skills. This realization sparked an idea in Blake's mind. Perhaps, to acquire specific skills in the future, he could seek out individuals related to those skills to increase his chances of obtaining them from the treasure chests. Ding! Intermediate cooking proficiency is now installed for the host. Ding! Installation successful. Suddenly, Blake felt a surge of knowledge flood his mind, his hands itching to demonstrate this newfound skill. He was confident that, given a kitchen knife, he could now carve intricate designs into tofu, a testament to his enhanced culinary abilities. This skill, although not magical, was something Blake had long desired, given his love for delicious food and his previous disastrous attempts at cooking. He had once begged Madame Marion to teach him, only to be promptly expelled from the kitchen after an hour. But now, Blake thought with a grin, he wouldn't have to worry about his cooking skills, or lack thereof, any longer. As he indulged in a small cake, Blake noted, Hmm, the taste is slightly off. A higher honey ratio would have made it perfect. This realization hit him. With his intermediate cooking skills, he could now discern the quality of other chefs' creations. Even the desserts from a reputable London shop seemed lacking compared to his own skill level. A surprising revelation considering the high standards expected of any chef daring to open a dessert shop in the city. This meant that the intermediate skill level was far more impressive than Blake initially thought, surpassing even the abilities of professional chefs. By this comparison, what he considered professional skills might only be deemed beginner level by the system's standards. With newfound respect for his intermediate cooking proficiency, Blake no longer underestimated the value of the skills he could acquire through the system. His excitement for the remaining treasure chests grew, eager to discover what other talents and surprises awaited him. Upon the bronze treasure chest, Blake's anticipation grew. This chest, a gift from the system, was a testament to the extraordinary benefits it could bestow, even at its most basic level. With his curiosity piqued, Blake eagerly awaited the unveiling of the next treasure chests. System, open the silver treasure chest, please, Blake requested, his voice tinged with excitement. The silver chest, a rare find dropped by none other than Dumbledore Pro, missed something exceptional. Given Dumbledore's proficiency in alchemy, Blake hoped for a skill or talent related to the art. As the system processed his request, a slow, deliberate voice announced, Ding, opening the silver treasure chest for the host. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining advanced alchemy talent. Alchemy talent, Blake mused, scratching his head. While Dumbledore was indeed a master alchemist, not quite on par with Nicole Lemur, but still highly skilled, this talent was a significant acquisition. However, for Blake, who had yet to delve into the magical world or alchemy, this talent remained out of reach, for now. Undeterred, Blake saw potential in this new talent. 
Perhaps, in time, it could pave the way for collaboration with the legendary alchemist Nicole Lemour, leading to further treasures and opportunities. With his spirits lifted, Blake turned his attention to the two gold treasure chests. These chests, indistinguishable from one another, held the promise of even greater rewards. One had been dropped by Hermione, the other by Dumbledore, and only by opening them would Blake discover their secrets. System, open one of the gold treasure chests, Blake commanded, his anticipation reaching a peak. Ding! Opening the gold treasure chest for the host! Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining the esteemed Runiwen talent. Runiwen? Blake pondered. He recalled that Hogwarts offered a course on ancient Runiwen in the third year, a subject that delved into the study of ancient runes. Typically considered dull and purely theoretical, its primary application was translating ancient documents written in Runiwen, akin to deciphering oracle bone inscriptions. Could this talent actually be useless? Blake wondered his excitement momentarily waning. Yet upon further reflection, Blake reconsidered the potential of ancient Ru Niwen. In Western legends, runes were often associated with magic. If ancient Ru Niwen bore similar magical properties, magical words, if that's the case, Blake thought, a spark of inspiration igniting within him, could I use parchment inscribed with ancient Ru Niwen as a talisman? With this revelation, Blake's imagination took flight, envisioning the myriad possibilities that this newfound talent could unlock. Chapter 12. A Grand Gesture. Unleashing Ancient Magic with Unprecedented Power. Blake was uncertain about the true potential of the ancient rune. For ages, wizards had regarded it merely as a relic of the past, with only a handful of master alchemists recognizing its magical potency. Yet Blake believed that his exceptional talent in ancient runes, combined with his academic genius ability, would enable him to uncover secrets that had eluded others. I need to make a trip to Diagon Alley, Blake mused, planning his shopping list. Magic books are definitely a priority. Wizarding books were notoriously expensive, but Blake had wisely amassed a considerable sum of money in anticipation of such expenses. His next step was to convert his earnings into gold at Gringotts, despite the goblin's reputation for greed. As he finalized his plans, Blake prompted the system to unlock the final golden treasure chest. Ding! Opening the golden treasure chest for the host. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining the ultimate spellcasting skill. Instantly, Blake's mind was flooded with new knowledge. He was thrilled. Rewards from the system's treasure chests varied in quality, but he found skills to be more valuable than talents. Skills were directly assimilated, bypassing the need for laborious practice. This contrasted with talents, which required a learning curve to harness their full potential. Thus, the ultimate spellcasting skill excited Blake more than the ancient rune talent. This skill significantly enhanced his magical abilities. Spells were easier to cast, their power was amplified, cooldown periods were shortened, and magic consumption was drastically reduced. Casting spells involved more than just knowing the incantation. A novice wizard had to meticulously follow the spell's pronunciation and wand movements as described in textbooks to achieve optimal results. Any deviation could result in failure or unintended consequences. Previously, Blake's lack of finesse in these areas meant his spells, while successful, lacked potency. This inadequacy had forced him to flee from a hidden monster, only defeating it later through sheer magical power. Now, equipped with this unparalleled spellcasting technique, Blake's weaknesses were eradicated. If his initial casting ability was likened to a narrow stream, it had now transformed into a vast, unobstructed river. His spellcasting was not only more efficient, but also significantly more powerful. Blake's newfound prowess promised a revolution in his magical capabilities. With the ancient rune secrets waiting to be unlocked and his spellcasting skills vastly improved, he was poised to make waves in the wizarding world. The journey ahead was filled with untold possibilities, and Blake was ready to explore them with his enhanced abilities. As Blake stood before the supreme treasure chest, his anticipation was palpable. The rewards from the gold and silver treasure chests had already surpassed his expectations, leaving him to wonder what extraordinary items the supreme treasure chest might contain. System, open the supreme treasure chest. Blake's voice quivered with excitement. A notification chimed, 
opening the supreme treasure chest. Another chime followed, congratulations to the host for obtaining ancient magic. A dark purple orb of light materialized before Blake, floating serenely like a demonic will-o'-the-wisp. Blake, puzzled yet intrigued, reached out his right hand towards the orb. Before his fingers could graze it, the orb seemed to be drawn into his palm, merging with his being. In that moment, Blake felt a profound tremor course through his body. His blue eyes momentarily transformed into a demonic purple, signaling the infusion of ancient magic. A sensation akin to being submerged in warm water enveloped him, though it soon faded, leaving his eyes their original hue. With the ancient magic now a part of him, Blake discovered new knowledge in his mind and felt an unfamiliar power coursing through his veins. This power was distinctly different from mem his magical energy, imbuing him with capabilities he had never possessed before. Upon delving into the newfound knowledge, Blake understood the essence of ancient magic. It was a spell of unparalleled simplicity, yet devastating attack power, capable of bypassing any defense. The spell's potency was such that it allowed the caster to eliminate their opponent in any conceivable manner. Blake's mind was filled with images, demonstrating the spell's versatility. Summoning lightning to reduce an enemy to ashes, shrinking an adversary to the size of an ant before crushing them, or draining an opponent's blood with a mere gesture. This magic's strength was limited only by the caster's imagination. However, the formidable power of ancient magic came at a cost. Its consumption of magical energy was immense, restricting Blake to only three uses per day, despite his enhanced magical capacity and mastery of spellcasting. Feeling the potent force within him, Blake murmured, This will be my ultimate move. The supreme treasure chest had bestowed upon Blake his most powerful asset yet, a trump card that would undoubtedly shape his destiny. Chapter 13 A Morning Surprise and Letters of Intent The morning sun bathed the room in a warm glow, yet Blake found the warmth a bit too intense for his liking. As he slowly opened his eyes, the source of the extra heat became apparent. Perched beside him on the bed was a magnificent fiery red bird. You, fox? Blake exclaimed, fully awake now. The previous night, he had delved into ancient magic, and the excitement had kept him awake for hours. He hadn't expected to wake up to the sight of Dumbledore's phoenix, Fox, the very next morning. Could Dumbledore be here as well? Blake scanned his small room but found no sign of the headmaster. Instead, Fox greeted him with an excited chirp and proceeded to pull a letter from beneath its wing, offering it to Blake with its claw. Uh, are you delivering a letter to me? Blake realized. Relieved that he had remembered to close the doors and windows the night before, allowing Fox to enter while keeping others out, he thought about the potential complications of someone else seeing the phoenix. It wasn't as if he could simply explain Fox's presence to Madame Marion as a peculiar, slightly red, Scottish chicken. Urged on by Fox, Blake opened the letter. The handwriting was unmistakably Dumbledore's, characterized by its unique flourishes. The letter was brief, requesting the loan of an item from Blake. After reading, Blake removed a tag from around his neck, one that had been fully restored and now gleamed metallically in the early morning sunlight. Fox gently tapped Blake's shoulder with its wing, cooing affectionately before taking the tag in its beak and vanishing in a burst of flames. Blake watched the phoenix disappear, understanding that Dumbledore must have discovered something significant to require his tag as evidence. Yet, it had only been one night, and Blake felt no rush. After Fox's departure, the room's temperature seemed to drop several degrees. Opening the door and windows to let in the fresh morning air, Blake then hurried excitedly to the kitchen. Meanwhile, Dumbledore received the tag from Fox, placing it among the various alchemical tools scattered across his desk. A meticulous examination began. Elsewhere, Mrs. Granger looked on helplessly as her daughter, Hermione, fussed over a newly acquired owl, noisy and emitting a peculiar odor. Hermione had insisted on returning to Diagon Alley that morning to purchase an owl specifically for sending letters. When asked whom she intended to write to, Hermione mentioned wanting to contact a Professor Granger, ever supportive of his daughter's endeavors, accompanied her to Diagon Alley. Upon their return, Hermione, without even pausing to name her new owl, immediately set to work writing two letters. She decided to send the first to Professor McGonagall, 
confident that the school's owl service would facilitate a reply. The second letter was for Blake, who did not own an owl, meaning her new owl would have to wait for his response before returning. Croak! Croak! The owl, barely accustomed to its new surroundings, was already being put to work. Yet, for the owl, this task was a welcome opportunity to stretch its wings. As the owl disappeared into the sky, Hermione reflected on the previous night's events. After parting ways with Blake and Professor Dumbledore, she had experimented with shapeshifting. In her room, Hermione was spellbound when she witnessed Blake effortlessly use the shapeshifting spell to vanquish a concealed beast. The sight ignited a spark within her to attempt the spell herself. Blake, who had previously been oblivious to the true nature of his abilities, considering them merely as some form of superpower, had mastered the shape-shifting spell with apparent ease. This led Hermione to believe that she, too, could achieve the same mastery. However, reality dealt her a harsh blow. In Blake's hands, a mere boulder could transform into a living, roaring lion, all without the aid of a wand. Meanwhile, Hermione struggled to make even the slightest alteration to a da small stone despite her use of a magic wand. The previous day, after Dumbledore and others had escorted her home, Hermione had inquired about the shapeshifting spell. Blake had nonchalantly explained that he simply envisioned the desired outcome, and it would materialize. Dumbledore had concurred with Blake's explanation, yet he, along with Professor McGonagall, had emphasized to Hermione that mastering the shape-shifting spell required systematic training. Damn it! Then why doesn't Blake need systematic training? Hermione lamented, frustration evident in her voice. He stumbled upon it by chance and didn't even use a magic wand. Each time she reflected on this, Hermione felt as though her pride had suffered a critical blow. After a fruitless night of attempts, she reluctantly abandoned her efforts. Without a mentor's guidance, she found herself at a standstill, prompting her to consider seeking advice from Professor McGonagall through a letter. The idea of purchasing an owl the following morning was born out of this necessity, though the letter to Blake was more of a friendly gesture. Despite her frustration, Hermione had to concede that Blake's innate talent surpassed her own. Yet the simplicity with which he described the shape-shifting spell continued to vex her. Meanwhile, at the Marian Orphanage, Blake was basking in the adulation of the children for his culinary prowess. Brother Blake's cooking is so delicious, they exclaimed, clamoring for seconds. Blake hadn't intended to showcase his cooking skills, he was merely experimenting. Despite his reliance on his cooking skill, he knew it wouldn't yield additional treasure chests. The children's joyous reactions triggered his system notifications, but to his disappointment, they all indicated a lack of sufficient emotional points to unlock a treasure chest. Blake realized that the likelihood of obtaining a treasure chest from the children was slim due to their young age. His hopes had been pinned on Lady Marion, whose culinary enlightenment he had inspired, but her emotions, though positive, were not as intense as her anger the previous night, failing to secure a treasure chest. This reinforced Blake's belief that negative emotions were more potent triggers for the system. Suddenly, a system notification alerted him to the presence of frantic emotions, rewarding him with a bronze treasure chest. Puzzled, Blake scanned the room, noting the children's happiness. Oh, Hermione, it must be you, right? He mused, realizing the source of the emotions. I'm crying. Really, you didn't forget to send me treasure chests from home. Chapter 14 Professor McGonagall is stunned, but he is only eleven years old. Dumbledore straightened his back with a sigh of relief, removing the special glasses perched on his nose. Blake's name tag lay quietly on the desk, its appearance subtly altered. The once pure black color had faded to a grayish black. Turning the name tag over, Dumbledore discovered an additional symbol on the back, one that hadn't been there before. Despite his vast knowledge, Dumbledore found himself unable to decipher the strange symbols within the circular emblem, save for one, the symbol of the Deathly Hallows. With a gentle press of his slender finger on the symbol, the entire array of symbols began to move, breaking down and reorganizing until they finally settled into a coherent line of text. GG Institute of Biology. Meanwhile, Professor McGonagall was engrossed in her work in her office. Despite it being summer vacation, her responsibilities were many, 
thanks in part to a headmaster who preferred not to meddle in administrative affairs. She was determined to complete her tasks before the school year commenced on September 1st. The sudden sound of flapping wings outside her window interrupted her thoughts. An owl, seemingly eager, bypassed the owl biscuits on her desk and dropped a letter before swiftly departing. With a flick of her wand, McGonagall summoned a teapot and teacup, which shakily poured her a cup of tea. As she took a sip, she noticed the sender of the letter, Hermione Granger. A smile crossed McGonagall's face as she recalled the bright, studious girl she had escorted to Diagon Alley. Hermione reminded McGonagall of herself in many ways, and she had grown quite fond of the girl. Curious about the contents of Hermione's letter, McGonagall set aside her tea to read. However, as she delved into the letter, her leisurely tea drinking came to an abrupt halt. A hidden monster? she exclaimed silently. The thought of Hermione encountering such a creature filled her with dread, despite knowing the girl was safe enough to have written the letter. To McGonagall, it was akin to a lamb facing a hungry wolf, an impossible battle for an eleven- or twelve-year-old wizard. But what truly astounded her was the claim that an eleven-year-old boy had used a transfiguration spell to defeat the monster. McGonagall had considered several scenarios in which Hermione might have been saved, but never had she imagined the monster would fall at the hands of a child. The notion seemed utterly absurd. Could the child be lying? This was McGonagall's initial thought. Transfiguration was a complex branch of magic, one in which she herself was considered a master. The idea that a mere 11-year-old could wield such power was beyond belief, yet the letter in her hands suggested otherwise. Throughout her journey to today's achievements, Professor McGonagall had exerted an immeasurable amount of effort. It was almost inconceivable for an 11-year-old wizard to cast even a basic illumination spell, let alone perform feats of advanced magic. Yet, Hermione had claimed that a boy of such tender age had used a transfiguration spell to vanquish a formidable concealment monster. Concealment monsters were notorious for their cunning and ferocity, posing a significant challenge even to seasoned adult wizards. The idea of a child accomplishing such a feat stirred a mix of skepticism and irritation in Professor McGonagall. She couldn't help but suspect the veracity of Hermione's account. Then she met Professor Dumbledore? Professor McGonagall mused, her brow furrowing in thought. Hermione's bold assertion seemed almost reckless. After all, verifying the truth with Dumbledore would be a straightforward matter. Could it be that Hermione was actually telling the truth? But the notion seemed far-fetched. An eleven-year-old prodigy capable of such advanced transfiguration? Hermione had described the spell as transforming a large rock into a stone lion instantaneously. Even if a young wizard possessed such skill in transfiguration, the magica, l power required for such a feat seemed beyond the reach of someone so young. The latter part of Hermione's letter sought advice on mastering the transfiguration spell, revealing her own struggles with even the simplest transformations. Sigh. What a naive girl. Transfiguration is not so easily mastered, Professor McGonagall thought to herself. Yet she began to entertain the possibility that Hermione might not have been fabricating her story. Perhaps the true savior was Dumbledore, acting from the shadows for reasons unknown. As Professor McGonagall pondered her response to Hermione's letter, a knock on the door interrupted her thoughts. Please come in, she called out. Dumbledore entered, his demeanor reflecting a hint of weariness. He explained his need to embark on a lengthy journey, apologizing for the inconvenience this would cause to their previously agreed-upon arrangements. Just as Dumbledore was about to leave, Professor McGonagall seized the opportunity to inquire about the incident described in Hermione's letter. Before she could fully articulate her suspicion that Dumbledore had intervened, he eagerly confirmed the boy's remarkable achievement. Dumbledore's excitement was palpable, as he praised the young wizard's unprecedented talent in transfiguration, revealing that the story was indeed true. Professor McGonagall was taken aback by this revelation. Hermione's account was accurate. An eleven-year-old boy had indeed used transfiguration to defeat a concealment monster. The news of such a prodigious student joining their ranks filled her with a mixture of astonishment and anticipation for the coming school year. Chapter 15 an unexpected gift from above, 
the system warehouse. It was a notion that bordered on the absurd. An 11-year-old child mastering transformation magic to such an advanced degree was unheard of. Yet, Dumbledore had confirmed it. Despite his penchant for the unexpected, his colleagues, including Professor McGonagall, knew him well enough to discern when he was serious. And now, faced with his earnestness, Professor McGonagall found herself grappling with belief. I understand your shock, Minerva, Dumbledore sighed, his expression one of resigned acceptance. When I first witnessed it, my surprise surpassed even yours. His gaze shifted past Professor McGonagall to the open letter on the table. This letter is from Miss Granger, correct? He inquired. Professor McGonagall nodded, confirming that Hermione had sought her guidance on transformation magic. No wonder, Dumbledore mused, a hint of nostalgia in his voice. She's a resilient child, much like you were. I suspect yesterday's events might have shaken her, but it's crucial she doesn't lose confidence in herself. Genius alone isn't enough. Perseverance is key. Understanding Dumbledore's intention, Professor McGonagall realized it was her role to respond to Hermione's letter, offering encouragement to prevent the girl from becoming disheartened. She knew all too well how easily pride could turn to fragility. Dumbledore, after a moment of contemplation, decided to share more. Since you're aware of the boy's prowess in transformation, it's time I tell you a bit more about him you would have found out eventually. Confused, Professor McGonagall awaited further explanation. It had been years since she'd seen Dumbledore look so troubled. That boy was once known as Blake Green, Dumbledore revealed. Recognition dawned on Professor McGonagall. She remembered Blake Green from the annual admissions process, a name among many she had noted in preparation for sending out Hogwarts acceptance letters. Take a look at the book of entry when you have a chance, Dumbledore suggested his tone serious. I'll explain more upon my return. For now, my theories are just that, unconfirmed. Curiosity peaked. Professor McGonagall respected Dumbledore's caution. She hoped his investigation wouldn't uncover anything dire, wishing for continued peace in the wizarding world. After Dumbledore's departure, Professor McGonagall made her way to the tower housing the Book of Entry, an unusual second visit in a single year. Upon finding Blake Green's entry, her eyes widened in shock. Green? Grindelwald? She gasped, noticing the name alteration. The revelation that Blake was a descendant of Grindelwald, and the absence of this detail in the book of entry, left her stunned. The full implications would have to wait for Dumbledore's return. Meanwhile, Blake was enjoying his breakfast, perusing Hermione's letter, when the system's alert interrupted his meal. Ding! Detected an emotion of shock! the system announced, followed by, Ding! Extracting a treasure chest for the host. Congratulations, you've obtained a gold treasure chest. Blake's fork clattered to his plate, noodles forgotten. Another treasure chest? He exclaimed, bewildered. Which benevolent deity sent me this? He stared at the gold treasure chest materializing before him, a mix of surprise and anticipation lighting up his face. In a moment of unexpected surprise, Blake pondered if Hermione was the cause. It seemed unlikely. He hadn't crossed paths with her in any way that day. Moreover, without any direct interaction, it was improbable she would be the source of his sudden fortune. The only logical explanation was that the system itself had triggered the treasure chest extraction. If not for this, the system might as well have continued its silent facade. Unbeknownst to Blake, the real catalyst was a letter from Hermione which had left Professor McGonagall both shocked and disheartened by his actions. Had Blake been aware of this, he would have rushed to Hermione's doorstep to express his grat, etude with an enthusiastic kiss. Hermione had inadvertently become his lucky charm, not only securing him a treasure chest, but also causing another to be sent his way. Fantastic! Blake exclaimed, his eyes gleaming at the sight of both a bronze and a gold treasure chest within the system space. His joy was palpable. Perhaps I should even buy a lottery ticket today, he mused, quickly finishing his breakfast before dashing back to his room. System, open the bronze treasure chest, he requested eagerly, returning to his room for the treasure chest opening. Blake's caution stemmed from the previous night's incident involving ancient magic, which had materialized something unexpectedly. He needed to avoid any unexplainable occurrences. Ding, the bronze treasure chest is now being opened for the host. Ding! 
Congratulations to the host for obtaining 50 gold coins. Blake stared in astonishment at the 50 gleaming gold coins that had been seamlessly transferred to the system warehouse. A system warehouse? This was a new discovery for him. With a mere thought, a gold coin materialized in his hand, causing his excitement to surge. This wasn't just about the monetary gain, it was the realization that the treasure chests could yield tangible items, not just talents and skills. With another thought, the gold coin vanished from his hand, reappearing in the system warehouse. Blake, unable to contain his excitement, grabbed a pen from his table and focused. In the next instant, the pen disappeared from his grasp, only to reappear beside the gold coins in the system warehouse. This was a revelation. Until now, Blake hadn't realized the system included a warehouse for physical objects, having assumed it was limited to storing treasure chests. The existence of a system warehouse opened up new possibilities. Damn it, useless system. You could have at least provided an instruction manual. Blake exclaimed, half in frustration, half in awe at his newfound discovery. Chapter 16, The Diamond Treasure Chest and the Grand Druid Template. In his room, Blake was about to test the capacity of the system warehouse when the system notification chimed in once more, bringing with it an unexpected surprise. Ding! Extremely shocked and worried emotions have been detected. Ding! Extracting a treasure chest for the host. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a diamond treasure chest. Blake was momentarily taken aback. What's going on? He wondered. Just moments ago, he had received a gold treasure chest from an unknown source, and now, a diamond treasure chest had appeared out of the blue. Moreover, it was a diamond treasure chest, second only to the supreme treasure chest in rarity and value. Only a moment earlier, Blake had been voicing his frustrations with the system. Yet, in the next, the system had presented him with another grand gift. This sudden generosity from the system, which Blake had always considered bold and unyielding, now made him feel a tad uneasy. Big Brother System, I admit I may have been a bit harsh earlier, but this, this is making me nervous, Blake thought to himself, half-jokingly. The origin of this diamond treasure chest was, in fact, Professor McGonagall. Her reaction was triggered upon seeing the surname Grindelwald, a name that once symbolized chaos and war. Currently, Professor McGonagall's greatest fear was the disruption of her peaceful life, especially since the wounds from Voldemort's reign of terror had not yet fully healed. The sight of another dark surname, especially in the context of Dumbledore's departure, had understandably caused her great distress, leading to her stress reaction and consequently the awarding of the diamond treasure chest to Blake. After ensuring that no divine retribution was forthcoming, Blake finally allowed himself to relax. Could someone have learned about the hidden monster I defeated yesterday? He pondered. Did Hermione spread the word? His gaze fell upon the letter on his desk and the owl perched outside his window. It dawned on him that if Hermione could write to him, then she could also communicate with others. That's an excellent strategy, Blake mused. If he continued to perform remarkable feats in the future, word of his actions could spread, potentially leading to more unexpected rewards. With a gleeful chuckle, Blake turned his attention to the owl, which seemed to be waiting impatiently. He retrieved a broken fountain pen from the system space and tore a piece of cardboard from a nearby cake box to pen a thoughtful reply to Hermione. Given her penchant for sharing, Blake anticipated that she would be instrumental in spreading news of his future exploits. The owl, though appearing disdainful, picked up Blake's letter in its beak and took flight. Watching the owl disappear into the distance, Blake closed the window and drew the curtains, his mind now fully focused on the treasure chests awaiting him in the system space. The bronze treasure chest had already provided him with some monetary gain, which, though modest, had activated the use of the system warehouse. Now, with two treasure chests before him, Blake was eager to discover what surprises they held, especially the diamond treasure chest, a prize only a step below the supreme treasure chest. As was his custom, Blake decided to open the lower level chest first. Ding, opening the gold treasure chest. Ding. Congratulations to the host for obtaining the supreme grade transformation skill talent. Ding, installing the supreme grade transformation skill talent for the host. In just a moment, 
Blake felt a significant improvement in his transformation skill, Heffer, a skill that had previously shown little progress despite his efforts. This advancement came without any active learning on his part. Now, with the combined enhancements of the Supreme Grade Genius Talent and the Supreme Grade Transformation Skill Talent, Blake's mastery over transformation skills promised to reach new heights. Blake's heart swelled with uncontainable exe, temant at the thought of his rapidly improving transformation skill. He had always known he possessed a talent for it, given his ability to perform transformations without any formal guidance, albeit at a basic level. Yet, he was acutely aware that his skill was nowhere near that of a prodigy. But now, with this newfound knowledge, he felt as though he had catapulted to the ranks of a top-tier genius in the art of transformation. However, in the midst of his elation, Blake's attention was irresistibly drawn to the diamond treasure chest waiting in his system space. The anticipation of what it might contain sent a thrill through him. System, open the diamond treasure chest, he commanded eagerly. Ding! Opening the diamond treasure chest for the host, the system responded. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining the big druid template. Ding! Would the host like to apply the template? Template? Big druid? Blake murmured, momentarily taken aback. He recalled the Gandalf template he had received from a novice gift pack, which had significantly enhanced his strength and magical abilities. However, his interactions with wizards had been limited, and without witnessing Dumbledore's power firsthand, he couldn't fully grasp the extent of his own growth. Yet, the realization that such a powerful template had emerged from a diamond treasure chest suggested that his initial novice pack might have contained a treasure of similar value. Without a moment's hesitation, Blake decided, apply the template. Ding! Applying the big druid template for the host. Ding! Template applied successfully. As the system's notifications chimed, a searing heat enveloped Blake's body, eliciting a sharp cry from him. In a desperate attempt to cool down, he stripped off his clothes, fearing he might spontaneously combust. But just as quickly as it had escalated, the heat dissipated, leaving Blake's skin flushed but no longer burning. Had he not seen the redness with his own eyes, he might have dismissed the entire episode as a figment of his imagination. With the heat gone, Blake discovered a wealth of knowledge flooding his mind, ancient and powerful druidic magic. He hastily redressed and approached the window, gazing out at the distant forest. To his astonishment, he found himself attuned to the natural world in a way he had never experienced before. He could hear the whispers of the trees, the breath of the earth, and even the squabbles of birds. This newfound connection filled him with a profound sense of kinship with all living things, granting him the intuitive understanding that he could communicate with, and perhaps even command, the creatures of the forest. As he marveled at this revelation, Blake noticed a peculiar sensation in his body, as if it were undergoing a transformation of its own. Trusting his instincts, he let the change take hold. In an instant, a green light enveloped him, and where Blake once stood, a black crow now perched. Moments later, the crow morphed into a cat, only for the feline form to vanish, leaving Blake standing in the room once more. This is the power of the big druid, Blake whispered in awe, realizing the immense potential that now lay within his grasp. Chapter 17, Grindelwald. Wanna know? I just won't tell you. Blake was ecstatic. With the great druid template, he discovered an extraordinary affinity for animals and plants. This was no small feat, it meant he could communicate with animals, allowing him to easily tame formidable magical creatures to serve as his allies. Similarly, his ability to converse with plants enabled him to understand their needs, facilitating the cultivation of various magical plants and herbs that were notoriously difficult to grow. Some of these plants, when nurtured properly, could even be utilized in combat. Moreover, Blake found that he could not only enhance the growth of plants and strengthen animals, but also transform into various animals himself. Regardless of the form he took, he would possess all the abilities of that animal. In terms of utility, the great druid template he had unlocked from the diamond treasure chest surpassed even the ancient magic he had obtained from the supreme treasure chest the previous night. As Blake familiarized himself with his new abilities, he uncovered another pattern regarding the system's treasure chests. 
If the quality of the chest was above diamond, the items obtained were not guaranteed to be directly related to the person who opened it. For instance, the ancient magic from the supreme treasure chest was not something Dumbledore was known for. Similarly, the diamond and golden treasure chests, likely from Professor McGonagall, contained items unrelated to her known skills, despite her being an animagus capable of transforming into a tabby cat. Eager to test his newfound druid abilities, Blake reached for the door handle, only to remember the restriction Madame Marion had imposed on him the night before. With a sigh, he withdrew his hand. Yet, he was not deterred. As a great druid, he had other means. Locking the door once more, he opened the window, and moments later a white pigeon silently flew out into the open sky. In Austria at Neumungard, Dumbledore revisited the land after many years. If not for Blake, he might have never returned to face the memories it held, nor the person it was associated with. The passage of time had erased much of the information about Grindelwald, leaving Dumbledore with more questions than answers, particularly about the mysterious G.G. Institute of Biology. The once majestic building was now in ruins, its walls barely holding the faded and broken letters that spelled out, For the Greater Good, a phrase Dumbledore remembered all too well. Except for the tower imprisoning Grindelwald, Numengard was a shadow of its former self, with no building left intact. Inside the tower, in a narrow stone room, a stooped figure huddled in a corner. His dark eyes, devoid of light, stared blankly ahead, his body a mere shadow of its former self after years of captivity. He remained motionless, like a stone puppet abandoned for millennia, until the sound of footsteps echoed through the room. The footsteps halted beneath the high window, too elevated for the imprisoned man to see who had come. Suddenly, the stone wall began to move, revealing. For decades, the stone wall had remained unyielding, but now it seemed to transform into water, stirring up ripples that expanded outward. A hole appeared, growing larger until it became a doorway. Framed by this new entrance, a tall, slender figure stood silhouetted against the light that poured in, illuminating the ground that had not felt sunlight for years, casting a mosaic of light spots around. Grindelwald, his dark eyes narrowed, strained to identify the visitor. As the figure stepped forward, recognition dawned on him. So it's you? Despite the years that had aged the man before him, stripping away the vigor of youth, Grindelwald recognized him instantly. Dumbledore, it's been a long time, he rasped, his voice hoarse and uncharacteristic. Dumbledore regarded his former companion, noting the frailty that had taken hold. A flicker of sadness crossed his eyes, but it was quickly masked. Grindelwald, indeed, I, T has been a long time, he acknowledged. What brings you here? Grindelwald asked, pushing himself up with the wall's support. Their paths had diverged long ago, and he knew Dumbledore's visit was not for the sake of old times. I have some questions for you, Dumbledore stated plainly, cutting straight to the heart of the matter. Grindelwald, though visibly exhausted by the effort to stand, indicated for Dumbledore to proceed. Ask away. Do you have any descendants? Dumbledore inquired, locking eyes with Grindelwald. The question visibly took Grindelwald aback, prompting a burst of wild laughter that seemed to consume all his breath. Dumbledore waited patiently for the laughter to subside before pressing, What's so amusing? Grindelwald, leaning heavily against the wall, gasped, Shouldn't you be the one to know whether I have descendants? That's precisely why I'm here, Dumbledore replied, producing a name tag that floated gently from his hand to Grindelwald. The sight of the name tag visibly shocked Grindelwald, his expression freezing momentarily before he hesitantly accepted it. It was clear he recognized the significance of the item. Not long ago, I met a boy, Dumbledore continued. He's exceptionally talented, and he told me his name was Blake Grindelwald. At the mention of the name, Grindelwald looked up sharply, surprise evident in his eyes. He then lowered his gaze to the name tag, tracing the name Blake with his finger. Suddenly he burst into laughter once more. Dumbledore, ever patient, waited for the laughter to end. This time, however, Grindelwald gestured for him to come closer. As Dumbledore leaned in, expecting a whisper, Grindelwald spoke. I know what you seek to find out, but I won't tell you, followed by another round of laughter. This exchange between the two old adversaries, filled with cryptic messages and unspoken histories, hinted at secrets deeply buried 
and a past that intertwined their fates more closely than they cared to admit. Chapter 18. Hunger. Rice. Seeking support. Grindelwald's laughter echoed maniacally through the room once more. Dumbledore, maintaining his composure, slowly straightened his back. Unlike what one might expect, there was no trace of anger on his face. Instead, he waited patiently for Grindelwald's laughter to subside before speaking softly. Just as I understand you, you should understand me as well. I won't harm the boy, Dumbledore continued, his voice calm and steady. No matter what connection he may have with you, the sins of your past have nothing to do with him. The smile gradually faded from Grindelwald's face as he retorted, You're still the same, always willing to tolerate all sorts of peculiar individuals, even if they're considered freaks or their origins are a mystery, but it seems I'm the only one you can't tolerate. Dumbledore cut him off. I gave you a chance. You should know that there's no one in this world more reluctant to be your enemy than I am. But you, let's not dwell on the past. My question remains the same. I want to know about the boy. Why does he possess the Dumbledore bloodline? Grindelwald fell silent, choosing not to answer Dumbledore's question. After a moment, Dumbledore sighed softly. Even if you won't tell me, I'll find out eventually. Hearing this, Grindelwald couldn't help but look up at Dumbledore, who continued, Biological Research Institute? I've had someone search every piece of information available in the wizarding world, but found no mention of it. Perhaps it's been too long, and the information has been lost. However, such terminology is not typically used in our world. It's more common among muggles, who are quite adept at preserving information. So, Grindelwald sighed realizing he could no longer keep this secret from Dumbledore. If Dumbledore were to investigate in the Muggle world, he would undoubtedly uncover the truth. Grindelwald had indeed collaborated with Muggles in the past, recognizing their advanced science and technology despite considering them inferior to wizards. After a pause, Grindelwald finally said, Let's go take a look at this place. You'll understand once you're there. He pressed a finger against the logo on a nameplate, and suddenly, an address appeared beneath the G, G Institute of Biology inscription, as if it had always been there, merely concealed. Dumbledore, taken aback by the nameplate floating back to him, cast a deep look at Grindelwald, realizing the implications. Let's go, Grindelwald muttered, retreating to a corner. No matter what you find there, remember your words, and be cautious. It was originally a failed experiment. This boy should never have existed, yet now he does. Be wary of the mastermind behind all this, and remember to close the door when you leave. With those words, Grindelwald curled up in the corner, disengaging from the conversation. A failed experiment? A boy who shouldn't exist? The mastermind? Dumbledore pondered these words, his wariness growing. He decided to visit the address Grindelwald provided, believing it would shed light on the mystery. After leaving, Dumbledore made sure to close the door behind him, restoring the stone wall to its original state. The narrow room was once again enveloped in silence. Time passed before Grindelwald suddenly looked up and called out, Gucci! Gucci! At the sound of a whip striking the ground, a house elf with a wrinkled face appeared. His clothes were tattered, and he seemed quite old. Master! the house elf exclaimed, ready to serve. Are you hungry? Gucci will prepare a meal for you immediately. Gucci was the last remaining house elf of the Grindelwald family. When Grindelwald was imprisoned in Nurmengard, she was the only one permitted to serve her former master. Her duties were straightforward, to ensure Grindelwald received three meals a day to prevent him from starving. You've heard the news, haven't you? Grindelwald inquired, his voice cutting through the silence. About the boy, the boy who carries Grindelwald's bloodline. Gucci, overwhelmed with emotion, could barely contain herself. Yes, master, I've heard. I can't believe how oblivious Gucci has been, not knowing until now that a young master still lives. Grindelwald interjected, halting Gucci's emotional outburst. Gucci, he commanded. Go, go and find that boy, he instructed, his tone firm yet laced with an unspoken urgency. Then return and inform me about his circumstances. Gucci hesitated, her loyalty torn. But my old master, if Gucci leaves... You will be left without sustenance. Grindelwald's command was unwavering. I've made my decision. Go and see the boy. Yes, yes, my old master. Gucci will leave at once, she replied, 
her voice a mixture of anxiety and determination. But please, allow Gucci to prepare sufficient dried food for you before I depart, she pleaded, showing her deep concern for Grindelwald's well-being. This time, Grindelwald did not object. Meanwhile, Blake stood dumbfounded before the massive creature before him. Can someone explain to me, he wondered aloud, why there's a giant Russian grizzly bear in England? The bear in question, a large, somewhat goofy-looking brown bear, stood directly in front of him. Blake was aware that brown bears were native to Russia, not England, especially not the suburbs of London. It was highly unusual for a bear to wander this far without encountering any barriers. Blake grimaced at the sight of the bear, finding himself at a loss for words. He had sneaked out to test his druidic abilities in the forest when this unexpected visitor appeared. Initially, Blake braced himself for an attack, but to his astonishment, the bear simply lay down in front of him, whimpering and acting like a petulant child. In essence, the bear seemed to be saying, Boss, I'm starving. Please feed me. This bizarre encounter left Blake questioning the natural order of things, yet he couldn't help but feel a sense of responsibility towards the creature. The bear's human-like plea for food tugged at his heartstrings, prompting him to reconsider his initial apprehension. Chapter 19 Blake's life experience. The answer is revealed. Yes, yes, Blake was incredulous. You're saying you ran away from the circus? The bear nodded with a sorrowful look in its eyes. And the circus people used to whip you with a small whip. Blake continued, his voice rising in disbelief. The bear's eyes welled up with tears, confirming his suspicions. They didn't even feed you? Blake was appalled. That's outrageous. How could they treat you like that? The bear seemed to shrink back, its sadness palpable. What? You ate half a cow for a meal? Blake's eyes widened in shock. Goodbye. He turned on his heel and sprinted away. The idea of feeding such a creature was ludicrous to him. Half a cow could sustain the entire orphanage for a month, and if sold, it could cover three months' worth of rations. However, Blake's escape was short-lived as he felt a pair of thick bear paws clasp around his leg. The bear looked up at him, tears streaming down its face. Let go of me, Blake protested. We're not meant to be. The bear whimpered, seeming to say Blake had misunderstood. It's not half a cow you eat, but half a cow's worth of food? Blake paused, his curiosity piqued. The bear nodded, and Blake was taken aback. They fed you cow feed to save trouble? That's inhumane. Seeing the bear's emaciated form, Blake's heart softened. If the bear didn't consume such an excessive amount of food, perhaps he could afford to take care of it. Besides, as a bear, shouldn't it be capable of hunting for its own food? Realizing the bear had been raised in the circus and lacked hunting skills, Blake, driven by his principles as a druid and a compassionate partner, decided to teach the bear how to fend for itself. He explained the basics of hunting, fishing, gathering honey, and picking berries. The idea of having a pet that he had to feed himself seemed absurd to Blake. By the end of their conversation, the bear, though tearful, seemed to understand and reluctantly said goodbye to Blake, returning to the forest to practice its new skills. However, it couldn't help but wonder why it ended up having to hunt for itself when all it wanted was for Blake to feed it. Meanwhile, in America, Los Angeles, Dumbledore appeared in front of a dilapidated factory building. Anxious and without notifying the United States Congress of Magic, he had arrived quietly, just as he had done before. The journey was trivial for someone of his capabilities. The factory was deserted, surrounded by rumors that kept the homeless and curious away. It was said that those who ventured too close either vanished or went mad. As a result, the building had been abandoned for decades. Dumbledore examined the nameplate, confirming he was at the right location. He looked up at the gloomy structure, then with a simple gesture, tapped the air in front of him. In an instant, the dilapidated factory vanished, replaced by a neat building with a sign that read GG Biological Research Institute. Taking a deep breath, Dumbledore entered the building. As he did, the space behind him rippled, and he disappeared, leaving the factory to resume its decrepit appearance. The magic had kept the building pristine despite its years of neglect. Dumbledore searched the building thoroughly until he found the most disordered room, which contained a huge, now empty Petri dish with a gaping hole. Dried culture liquid stained the floor. 
It didn't take long for Dumbledore to find what he was looking for, as it wasn't hidden. There was no need for concealment, after all. Dumbledore carefully opened the thick experiment log, his fingers methodically turning each page. Despite its volume, he swiftly located the information he sought. After a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, he closed the log, a bitter smile playing on his lips. Grindelwald had indeed presented him with a formidable challenge. Yet, Dumbledore's thoughts drifted to a promise he had made to Grindelwald not long ago, a promise not to harm the boy in question. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Blake was boo, Cy preparing dinner, surrounded by an excessive amount of salmon. Mrs. Marion, looking on with a mix of confusion and mild annoyance, questioned, Blake, why did you buy so much salmon? The children surely can't eat all of this. It's fine, Mrs. Marion. I'm handling the cooking tonight. Blake reassured her, gently ushering her out of the kitchen. Despite her soft grumbling, Mrs. Marion couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. For reasons unknown to her, Blake's culinary skills had improved dramatically, and now she found herself being pushed out of the kitchen to join the other children in waiting for dinner. Blake had his reasons for preparing so much salmon. Although he had encouraged the big silly boy to fend for himself, he couldn't shake off his concern that the boy might struggle to find food given his upbringing in the circus. As he cooked, Blake secretly stashed away a significant portion of the salmon in his system warehouse, planning to offer it as an extra meal to the big silly boy when needed. Blake, Mrs. Marion re-entered the kitchen, interrupting his thoughts. Yes? Blake paused, turning to face her. An old man is outside asking for you, she informed him. Blake's hands stilled momentarily. He knew who had come to visit. The arrival of this visitor meant that a decision had been reached. In a modestly furnished room, Dumbledore took a seat on the room's sole, somewhat rickety chair, while Blake chose to sit on the bed. Opening a box of chocolates, Blake offered it to Dumbledore, apologizing for the lack of tea. It's quite all right, my boy. I've brought my own, Dumbledore replied with a warm smile. With a wave of his hand, a floating tray bearing an elegant tea set materialized. The tea set autonomously poured a cup of tea and floated it towards Blake. Thank you, Blake said, accepting the cup. So you must have reached a conclusion? Blake inquired, a hint of anticipation in his voice. Yes, I have uncovered everything, Dumbledore began, pausing briefly before adding, including the truth about your background. Chapter 20, Grindelwald's Insane Experiment, The Creation of Life. That's the story, Dumbledore concluded, after recounting his past dealings with Grindelwald. He picked up his teacup, taking a thoughtful sip as his gaze wandered around the modest room. It struck him as oddly familiar, reminiscent of an orphanage visit many years prior. The occupant of that room, he recalled, would later unleash a tempest of bloodshed. His eyes shifted to Blake, and internally, he vowed to prevent Blake from walking down such a dark path. So that's the situation? Blake feigned surprise, despite already knowing the story. He had, after all, prompted Dumbledore to share it. Now, it was time to delve into more personal matters. Then, what is my connection to Grindelwald? Why was I abandoned at the orphanage? Blake inquired, his voice laced with curiosity. Dumbledore sighed, the weight of his next words heavy on his heart. He took a moment to gather his thoughts before speaking. You've just heard the tale of those times. You're aware that Grindelwald was obsessed with Credence Barebone, Dumbledore began, referring to a tragic figure entangled in their shared history, who ultimately chose the path of light over darkness. Regarding your origins, it all began with Credence, or rather, my nephew, Aurelius Dumbledore, and his departure from Grindelwald's side, Dumbledore explained. His departure? Blake pressed, sensing the gravity of the revelation to come. Yes, with Aurelius gone, Grindelwald sought a new weapon, one sharper, more resilient, and easier to wield. He envisioned creating the ultimate weapon, Dumbledore continued, his tone grave. To achieve this, Grindelwald founded a biological research institute, enlisting a master alchemist from the wizarding world and leading biologists from the non-magical world. At that time, Grindelwald and I were considered the two most formidable sorcerers, Dumbledore admitted, not without a hint of reluctance. He used a drop of my blood, taken many years prior, combined with his own. Through advanced alchemy and cutting-edge biology, a new life form was conceived. 
Grindelwald's ambition was to imbue this being with the talents of both great sorcerers. Dumbledore paused, allowing Blake to process this monumental information. The revelation was staggering. Grindelwald had attempted to create life itself. Blake was momentarily overwhelmed, feeling as if a whirlwind of emotions was engulfing him. Am I that life form? he asked, seeking confirmation. Dumbledore nodded affirmatively, and Blake felt a chill run through him. So, I'm not truly human? I'm merely a creation? A monster designed to further his grand ambitions? No, child, you are human, Dumbledore firmly stated, dispelling Blake's fears. You are not a monster. But I don't have a mother, do I? Blake's voice was tinged with sadness. Dumbledore hesitated, acknowledging the unique circumstances of Blake's origin. Indeed, you were created in a laboratory. However, you are still human. In the muggle world, there's a term for it. Cloning, I believe. Blake understood Dumbledore's attempt at reassurance, though he knew his situation was far more complex than that of a clone. What then? If this experiment was deemed a success decades ago, why was I only born eleven years ago? Blake posed the crucial question, seeking to unravel the mystery of his existence. The question hung in the air, a testament to the complexity and ethical ambiguity of Grindelwald's experiment. Dumbledore prepared to delve deeper into the tale, ready to shed light on the dark corners of Blake's origin and, perhaps, help him find his place in a world that had never been meant for someone like him. The experiment was deemed a success by some, as Blake had seemingly inherited the strengths of two of the greatest wizards. He was confident that, even without a magical system to guide him, he would surpass the achievements of Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Yet, a question lingered in his mind. Why hadn't he been born decades earlier? No, B, Lake, Dumbledore said with a soft sigh, a hint of sorrow in his voice. That experiment, it wasn't successful. Blake's eyes widened in shock. Failed? If the experiment had failed, then how did he exist? Dumbledore continued, his voice heavy with regret. Although the fetus was born physically perfect, there was a critical flaw. He had no soul. He was merely an empty shell. An empty shell could never become a formidable weapon. And by the time we realized this, our counterattack had already begun. The research institute was evacuated, and you, being deemed a failure, were left behind, sealed within a petri dish. Understanding dawned on Blake. The experiment had indeed failed. His existence was the result of an unforeseen anomaly. His soul's sudden appearance had turned a failed experiment into an unexpected success. But that doesn't make sense, Blake protested. If I was considered a failure, why did it take decades for someone to release me? Why was I abandoned at an orphanage with my name tag altered, Grindelwald's surname crossed out, and who has been trying to reveal my origins to me now that I'm an adult? Dumbledore regarded Blake with a look of admiration. You're a perceptive young man, Blake. These questions strike at the heart of the matter. There is someone behind the scenes, a mysterious manipulator, who intends to use you as a controllable weapon once you reach adulthood. Images of the wizard who had abandoned him flashed through Blake's mind, though he couldn't recall the face or the details of the attire. So, what am I to do? Blake pondered aloud. This experiment was a failure. If I hadn't undergone transmigration, the manipulator would have ended up with nothing more than a soulless body, incapable of being shaped into the weapon he desired. Could my transmigration be linked to this manipulator's plans? Perhaps he was merely experimenting, Dumbledore suggested. He might not have held much hope initially, but he certainly didn't anticipate your miraculous revival. Dumbledore's explanation shed light on the situation, but it also raised more questions about the mysterious forces at play and their intentions for Blake. The revelation of his origins and the manipulator's plans hinted at a complex web of intrigue that Blake was now a part of.